Hello Year 10, I hope you're safe and well. It's Mr Anger here. Welcome to Lesson 5, How is Flooding Measured and Managed? And just a reminder, even though I'm doing the PowerPoint, please send your work to your usual classroom teacher. So in order to understand the work for this week, we need to do these three things. First of all, we need to describe a hydrograph. And now we'll have a look at what a hydrograph is in a moment, um, but uh, it looks a little bit complicated but actually it's really not. We need to explain why flooding happens and then evaluate the management options available to us that can reduce the flood risk. So here is our storm hydrograph and it looks like a right mess, doesn't it? There's loads of information on there, but don't worry, we're gonna go through this uh, step by step. The first thing I always do whenever I'm confronted with what looks like quite a complicated diagram or graph or chart is I look at the axes. So down here at the bottom on the x-axis we've got time and you can see that there's two days here isn't there. There's hours um, up here um, but then that's um, categorized into two days for us. Then on the y-axis we've got a couple of different things going on. So we've got precipitation over here, oops, um, and that's in millimetres. But then we also seem to have something else as well. And we've got runoff and um, discharge in cumex, and that's the uh, basically everything from sort of uh, this point onwards. Um, and this down here is the millimetres in rainfall. So you need to recognise that precipitation means rainfall and just over here we've got quite a handy um, label which says rainfall event and essentially you can see that it's been raining between these hours here it's been raining okay um, now that's all very well and good and we know that when it rains that rainwater will eventually find its way into our rivers so that's where this line comes in and this blue line here um, refers to the discharge that the river is providing so the the discharge being the amount of draining that the river is doing the amount of water that's, that's in the river that's um, being removed from our drainage basin um, and down here we've got Base flow. So this is normally what we expect the river to be doing and right? this is what our normal um, expectation for this river is. However because we've had this rainfall event, because we've had this storm here, um, it's not going to do what we normally, normally think. Um, it's actually going to um, massively increase its discharge. So you can see that there's been a bit of a time delay isn't there? There's been a bit of a time delay going from here the peak rainfall to the peak discharge of the river and that's because obviously it takes a little while for all of the rain that has fallen anywhere within a drainage basin to make its way into the actual river. And you can see that there's this lag here isn't it? it's called the lag time but this blue line refers to the river discharge that's had that happened as a result of this rainfall event and you can see here can't you that it's it's pretty pretty big um, it will also however drain um, this water pretty quickly and it will fall as well so we've got a rising limb over here on this side so you need to refer to this as the rising limb and then the falling limb I call it you could also call it the recessional limb um, uh, over on the other side down here and so essentially that's all it is. You are looking at three things. You're looking at time, you are looking at a rainfall event, how much rainfall has taken place, and then how much discharge there has been. Let's put the R um, cross there, the discharge there. Um, and at this point, it's really, really important to recognise that um, the amount of discharge and the behaviour of this line um, is going to change depending on what sort of environment you're in. Now if you want another explanation of that, if mine wasn't clear enough, have a look at this video here. This video is pretty useful uh, for understanding hydrographs. 
Okay, so just to summarize what I've just said, hydrographs um, show time on the x-axis and river discharge and rainfall on the y-axis. They demonstrate how the amount of rainfall um, impacts the river. Um, and importantly, as I sort of just, uh, just suggested there, um, rivers in urban and rural environments will respond differently. And I'm gonna show you this now. Now, these two diagrams are much, much more simple than what I've just shown you. And what we don't have in these two diagrams is the precipitation. And the reason that we don't have them is because we're just going to assume that the precipitation level is exactly the same. But what's not the same is the location. OK, so even though it's the same rainfall event, we've got an urban area, so somewhere like Maidenhead, maybe, and then the rural area somewhere outside of Maidenhead um, in the countryside. And you can see that although time um, and discharge is exactly the same, in the urban area, we've got quite an extreme peak, haven't we? Um, very, very quick uh, levels of uh, river discharge, then it falls very quickly. And in the rural area, we've kind of got the opposite. It's, um, it seems to, to peak much more slowly. Uh, it seems to be taking water much, much longer to get into that river. And what we've got here is a much, much flatter curve. Um, I'm sure at the moment with all the coronavirus, uh, you've heard about the government wanting to flatten this curve. Well, that's actually what the rural river has done with the amount of discharge. We don't have this extreme peak um, that we get in urban areas. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Once we have understood how um, rivers in urban areas and rural areas, or once we can describe, perhaps I should say, how they are different, um, then we can start asking ourselves why. What I'd like you to do just for this um, next three, four minutes is pause the video and think of how many reasons you can come up with to explain why a urban and rural river discharge might be different after a storm event. OK, welcome back. Let's see what you found out. So what I'd like you to do is split your page into physical causes for flooding and human causes for flooding. Now, as we look at all of these different causes for flooding, um, we're, going to, we're going to talk through them and help us explain why um, they're going to impact urban and rural areas differently. However, um, what I would say um, is that you need to be trying to think about all of these impacts um, as we are doing this uh, this next activity. OK, so just draw physical causes, human causes and a T table here, this table that looks like a T. OK, and we will talk through these one by one. So um, first of all, uh, excessive levels of precipitation. Um, so that is the first thing that will always happen uh, if there's a lot of rain then you might expect uh, higher levels of flooding. Now that's the same in rural and urban areas, but what I would say um, is the golden rule of flooding is that if you can reduce the speed at which water gets into the local river, then you are less likely to have a flood, okay? So the more quickly rainwater gets into the river, the more quickly you're going to experience, or the, more like, the higher the likelihood that you're going to experience a flood. OK, um, so natural cause of flooding, lots and lots of rain. Well, floods have always happened. They haven't only just happened since uh, humans have, have uh, started building cities and things like that. So um, that's the first one. Now, secondly, um, when the surface is baked hard for a long period of time. Now, this um, kind of cracking here, um, you might be uh, might be seeing some of that at the moment. Um, that's called or what we refer to this as baked ground. And um, Essentially, when a uh, when rain falls on it like that, because it's baked hard, it acts a little bit like concrete. It becomes very, very difficult for the rainwater actually to infiltrate into um, this type of um, very, very hard concretey uh, soil. So rather than infiltrating, it runs off the surface and um, water that's running over the surface of a of the ground always gets into rivers more quickly than water that's had to go through the soil. 
So water that goes through the soil travels very slowly. Water that travels over the soil is going to travel very, very quickly. So if there's a river up here somewhere and we've got this type of very, very hard baked ground, then you can reasonably assume that the, a lot of that water is just going to flow over the ground and into the nearest river. And then that river is going to become overwhelmed very, very quickly. OK, so physical causes of flooding. I should say... Um, uh, this type of, um, of, of flooding often occurs in places that experience a wet and a dry season. So uh, places like uh, uh, the savannah biome in Africa, um, they often get very, very um, long or nine month periods of no rain at all. The soil is baked very hard and then they get loads of rainfall. And often what happens is that rainfall then runs over the surface of the ground. It strips away all the nutrients. Um, meaning it's very difficult to farm, but then it also overwhelms the local rivers. Now, the shape of the land is also really, really important. So this town here is uh, nestled right into the, well, right in this valley. So again, any rainwater is going to be moving down these slopes pretty quickly, uh, and it's going to be ending up in this river here very quickly as well and I'm afraid the people who are going to be living here are going to find themselves pretty vulnerable to flooding. Now this one here uh, refers to uh, permeability so essentially is the rock that we are um, stood on is the geology um, is it porous or is it impermeable so a porous rock which allows water through it a little bit like this one here, will um, have a greater capacity to carry water um, than something with low permeability. And that's because if we draw some soil on the top, um, this soil here, oh dear, this soil here um, is able to withstand or, or continue to hold a lot of water because some of that water is going to make its way into the rock. Now if that can't happen then the water pools in the soil here then this soil is going to quickly become saturated and when it becomes saturated it goes over the ground and I'm just going to make this point right now all right so saturated soil looks like this and when it looks like this that means essentially that um, the, the soil is full, it's, it can't take any of it, any more water, a little bit like a sponge. When you first start running a water over a sponge, it starts to absorb it, but eventually that sponge reaches saturation. And then rather than the water flowing into the sponge, the water will start flowing over the side of the sponge once it's saturated. Well, if the geology under this um, this uh, or wherever this picture is taken was porous was was different then you might find that the saturation of this land is is less likely um, however if you've got a, an impermeable rock under here then you will find that the soil gets saturated pretty quickly and again going back to our golden rule this water is now going to travel over the ground rather than through the ground. It's going to get into the river quickly rather than slowly. And essentially, we are then going to find that the river may well become overwhelmed. Now, I hope what you're, um, you're beginning to recognise with this um, water travelling quickly over the ground and slowly through the ground, um, have a think about what this might relate to with regard to our urban and our rural settings. Because I said to you, didn't I, that urban and rural settings were different and an urban setting is likely to experience a, a, a big spike very quickly after a rain event in the river's discharge. Um, so let's have a look. Uh, well, we've got here some concrete and obviously concrete, a little bit like the saturated soil or the impermeable rock, doesn't absorb water. Um, the water is flowing over the, the ground here and again it's going to make its way into a river very very quickly. Humans tend to cut down trees and trees do a really really important job. Uh, first of all they um, 
intercept rainwater. These tree branches are intercepting rainwater, meaning that that rainwater doesn't get into the soil as quickly as it otherwise would do. Um, some of the rainwater is evaporated straight off the leaves. Okay, um, that's called transpiration. Some of the rainwater uh, moves down the uh, the branches and the, uh, the, the the trunk of the tree. That's called stem flow. Um, but that reduces the speed at which the water gets to the soil. Certainly, if you can, if you compare it to the water just dropping from the sky. Now, once it's in the soil, the tree roots drink some of the water, and that means that the soil is less likely to become saturated. Now, I'm going to try and play this video here for you, but this is a really, really great demonstration of how and why trees can reduce the impact of flooding. Um, so if it doesn't work or if you want to watch it again, have a look at this video here, uh, but let's have a go. So knowing why flooding happens helps us to prevent the flood itself. Now, um, what I'm going to do is talk through um, each of these ways in which we can reduce flooding, but I'm just going to summarise it quite briefly. Now, if you want to um, go back, please feel free to pause the video or open up the PowerPoint version of this slide. Now, dams um, are really good because essentially what they do is they can or they allow us to control the flow of water uh, through the um, the, the river channel. So if we are experiencing high uh, river levels over here, we can stop the water. And um, again, if we're experiencing maybe a bit of drought further downstream, we can open them. Um, there are lots and lots of issues, though. Remember our, our third objective. We need to know um, and explain how um, the, the or what, what to do with regard to managing river floods how they can be managed but we also need to be able to evaluate them so what are the the, the good things and the bad things about dams well um, first of all they're hugely expensive right? really really expensive and, and it's not that uh, it's not really possible that every country or, or every region of a country will be able to do this secondly all of this um, water up here because it's been dammed has flooded this area so naturally this river would look fairly similar to what you've uh, the, the image that you've got downstream of the dam but by doing this you have flooded a vast area and there are lots of examples of countries um, and particularly the Three Gorges Dam is a, an example of this where they've built an enormous dam and loads and loads of land behind that dam um, has been flooded purposely flooded and that's included farmland and people's homes um, finally, from an ecological point of view and an environmental point of view, um, you've interrupted, you put a, a big barrier in between um, in, in this river and it stops things like sediment from moving um, from the upper source to the lower course. And we know, don't we, that that's a, a, a really important natural phenomenon that occurs. And the reason it's important is that lots and lots of um, plants and animals rely on that very fertile sediment to make its way downstream so that they can um, they can use it as uh, uh, use it for their um, uh, for their habitat so that they can survive. It also prevents fish making their way up and downstream and many fish species go upstream to, um, uh, to spawn and to, to breed and obviously this barrier stops them from doing that and there's all kinds of ecological knock-on effects uh, from dams. Embankments. Um, now these are, again can be pretty effective. You've got um, essentially a, a river over here and obviously if a river level rises then you've got uh, or river level is going to have to rise pretty significantly for it to topple this. Okay. Issues with this though, um, they are sort of soil, they're, they're not as robust, they're not as, um, uh, they're not as, as hard wearing as certainly something like a dam and um, they need regular maintenance, all, which, all of which costs a lot of money. But the other issue is that if the water does topple over here, it's now got a load of potential energy. And that means that if you live um, on this side, rather than the water spilling out um, at its normal rate, rate relatively slowly and, and, um, and gently, it's now gonna come rushing down this side of the embankment and it's going to do an awful lot more damage. 
Flood walls, um, again, work in a pretty similar way to uh, the embankments, but, well, you tell me, how how attractive does that look? Uh, to me, uh, it's not great, and again, they are also quite expensive, uh, but rivers are attractive things, and, and we live in a riverside town, so if any of you have been to um, the Thames at Maidenhead recently, um, have a think about um, the, the impact, the visual impact of something like this. I think it would be, be a real shame. Um, you can also um, straighten the river. Now, what that does is that allows you to um, to drain this water uh, that the river um, is carrying much, much more quickly. So um, a straight river will carry water out to the sea more quickly, and that will help um, drain the land more quickly. Um, huge engineering project, though. Um, and um, yeah, they, they tend not to look particularly natural um, and um, yeah, hugely expensive, also destroys natural habitats. Afforestation. Um, so afforestation is the opposite of deforestation. It means planting trees rather than cutting them down. And I think we've seen, haven't we, how important planting trees is for, um, for the reduction of flooding. However, what we would say is that on its own it's not enough floods will happen and continue to happen and you also have to recognize that where you plant all of these trees and these forests you can't then use that land for farming you can't use it for housing and you have to recognize that even though it, it may be a fantastic um, flood defense and it may be fantastic for the environment there's going to be some social and economic knock-on effects from that and can you afford or would you want to pay much more for your food um, you might be able to but maybe there are other people around the world or even in this country who can't um, we in this country uh, have an issue with with house prices being very very high and as young people you may um, feel that house prices should come down a bit well the reason that house prices are often high is because of the availability of land and um, that means that yeah again um, afforestation might be a, a, an option which actually means that your house is going to be more expensive in the future you know, warning systems um, again um, really really effective these uh, they they tell you when a um, flood is on its way um, typically they are issued via uh, phone tv uh, internet radio um, but you always have to recognize that um, some people maybe the most vulnerable people might not have access to um, this information it's also information it's not actually going to stop the flood uh, like a flood wall would for example so um, it can just it just alerts people it just gets people out of the way it might reduce the death toll of a flood but it won't reduce the damage now dredging um, dredging essentially means um, if you have a look at the the um, diagrams down here over time sediment um, builds up in rivers um, and certainly lots and lots of um, uh, debris maybe sometimes shopping trolleys and rubbish and things like that and dredging essentially just means digging that sediment out you can see that happening down here so digging the sediment out um, and essentially what you are doing is you are increasing the capacity of that river so that river is essentially now able to carry more water Issues, well again, uh, the labour costs are quite high. Um, this is a sort of fairly um, uh, mean piece of machinery here and uh, you need some, some highly qualified uh, trained people to do it. And you will also invariably damage ecosystems. This, this sediment, this um, uh, uh, fertile soil is, is, is very, very important for natural habitats and, um, and, and lots and lots of animals and plants will rely on this in order to live. Okay, so just as a recap, um, we've described a hydrograph and we've explained how it works and we've explained why floods happen. Um, and we've even introduced the idea that floods happen differently in a um, urban area to a rural area. And essentially the reason for that was because in urban areas, water gets into rivers much more quickly over the ground, over the impermeable concrete than it would do in rural areas, which have soil and lots of trees. We've had a look at all of the management options um, uh, available to reduce the flood risk, and now it's up to you to decide which 
management option you like the best and the least and importantly to justify that to say why. Thank you very much. I hope you find it helpful. I uh, hope you stay uh, safe and well. Again, if you have any questions, please contact one of your uh, classroom teachers and submit the work to them. Thanks very much.